Hi, everyone. My name is Hamil Gada. I'm an interventional cardiologist and the medical director of the Structural Heart Program at UPMC Pinnacle in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, United States. I have the honor of uh, being involved in this session on cusp overlap technique uh, with my colleagues, Dr. Yohai Ono, Dr. Tomohiro Sakamoto, and Dr. Norio Tada. Uh, today, we have a few different learning objectives that I'd like to go over. So we'll advance to that slide. We're going to review the key procedural elements of the cusp overlap technique. We do want to discuss whether we believe that cusp overlap technique is now the standard of care. And I know Dr. Ono has some exciting evidence with regards to his experience with cusp overlap, and I'll be presenting some other global data that may be compelling as well. We will review and discuss a case utilizing cusp overlap technique and the latest Evolute product iteration Pro Plus and considerations around procedural experience and lifetime management. This also includes some discussion with regards to coronary reaccess and commissural alignment and how we integrate commissural alignment with the cusp overlap technique to basically ensure that we have the best possible access to the coronary arteries. We also want to discuss how to evolve the cusp overlap technique to standard of care if it is not that already. So without further ado and uh, leaving ample time for discussion, I'd like to forward to the first part of our uh, session today where I have a, a recorded presentation in which I will review the key procedural elements of the cusp overlap technique and review the latest clinical evidence and a very exciting post-market analysis that's being done now globally, Optimize Pro. So why don't we just forward to that? Thanks, Hamut, for the great introduction. I would like to encourage the audience, participants, to actively uh, write your thoughts, comments, questions to the chat. I will pick up and uh, interact with all the other discussed discussants. So, Hamut, please. We have um, Chatmaster Norihiko Kamioka, my great colleague here. So, uh, any kind of comments, questions are encouraged. Hi. I'm Hamil Gata. I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, residing in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it's a pleasure for me to be a part of this conference and present to you the key procedural elements of the cusp overlap technique and review of some very exciting data with regards to the self-expanding valve and its outcomes specifically related to permanent pacemaker implantation. But as you'll find, it's a little bit more complex than that. And then also in that, a review of the optimized pro post-market analysis. So without any further ado, let me just summarize what the cusp overlap technique as far as the highlights are concerned. Um, this view that we're going to get with this technique is going to provide a very good anatomic reference for deployment depth at the point of contact, which is a non-coronary cusp for the Evolute self-expanding transcatheter heart valve. Uh, the cusp overlap view basically takes the standard traditional coplanar view and overlaps the right and left coronary cusps, leaving the non-independent. So it's going to maintain the basal plane alignment of the coronary cusps. Similarly, this view is also going to elongate the left ventricular outflow tract in a long axis view, similar to your TE120 view or your uh, parasternal uh, long axis or apical three chamber views on transthoracic echocardiography. And by doing this, if you have a stiff enough wire, it'll embed itself in the non right commissure. So when you're coming down with your delivery catheter, the parallax will be removed out of the marker band of the delivery catheter, providing a little bit more reliable of a landmark as to where you're actually starting your deployment. It's going to assist with visualization of the membranous septum fluoroscopically, and we'll talk about that. And then as you'll note here, as the image twists from more of a traditional coplanar to a cusp overlap, the aorta actually becomes a little bit more vertical. So you may think that you're dealing with a horizontal route, but when you twist into a cusp overlap view, it actually may become a little bit more vertical. We like to predict this on CT scan, as I'll demonstrate, uh, but this is really the uh, summary of why this view uh, works so well. It really is a remarkable reference to the conduction system. 
So some advantages of the cusp overlap technique, uh, this, this, this required no research and development. It's completely organic. Myself and a bunch of colleagues around the world basically pioneered this thing. It's a marriage between comprehensive procedural planning and all the design benefits of the Evolute platform. We navigate the native conduction anatomy, never lose reference to it, thereby decreasing pacemaker rates. We enhance the predictability of transcatheter aortic valve replacement with no foreshortening and the ability to implant with sub-millimeter precision. We maintain the wrap high against the leaflets, providing the most surface area contact and decreased paravalvular leak. We'll go over that with Optimize Pro. We better visualize commissural alignment relative to the native anatomy, and we perform an efficient procedure. And that really is the, uh, the biggest thing to take away from this. And it has predictable outcomes. We get in, we get out very quickly uh, with regards to this technique. So there is a very comprehensive uh, summary of the cusp overlap technique, as well as uh, implanters around the world and their experience uh, with this uh, supplement uh, that's available online and uh, through your Medtronic rep as well. Uh, they, they can get this for you, but I think it's pretty good reading if you're very interested in learning more about the cusp overlap technique. So this is the breakdown, really, uh, we call it DART. Uh, we're going to determine the cusp overlap image projections, assess our depth accurately at the non-coronary cusp, reduce interaction with the conduction system, and then finally trust the cusp overlap view and verify our left coronary cusp depth in the LAO view. So uh, the hallmark or the underpinning of it really is the conduction system and where the conduction system arises on the left ventricular side, which is basically housed in the membranous septum to a variable length um, after it exits out of the compact AV node, which is more on the right atrioventricular side of the septum. Basically, coursing into the septum are going to be these hispurkinji fibers that will then emanate more superficially when we get into the muscular septum and the true left bundle. And basically, your goal is to position the valve uh, such that the lowest touch point is within that body of the membranous septum. Because if you get below that, you can traumatize the conduction system, leading to a higher rate of conduction disturbances. And so the great thing about this particular view is that it will isolate the non-coronary cusp, which is the lowest inserted cusp, and it will put the non-right commissure in the center of the screen. And so there's going to be no foreshortening to the membranous septum. There's going to be no foreshortening to the conduction system as it exists below the AV node. And you'll be able to very reliably pin your valve at a location given no foreshortening of the conduction system and similarly no foreshortening of the transcatheter heart valve as it's being deployed, you'll be able to really provide a very precise uh, implantation uh, of this valve. So it's uh, you know really uh, important to understand that in other views, this relationship is not really maintained, i.e. the relationship between the conduction system and the insertion of the non-coronary cusp in the three cusp coplanar in the LAO view, you get a lot of foreshortening. And so you really aren't able to readily differentiate the insertion of the non coronary cusp with the conduction system proper. Whereas in the cusp overlap view, that differentiation is quite um, easily ascertained. So we do this on CT scan as far as set up the view, and we go to the true nadir of each cusp on 3Mencio, this is reconstruction software, and we basically put dot markers at the true insertion of each coronary cusp, and that basically is going to reconstruct the annular plane in a way where we can provide a very reliable and valid cusp overlap view. You can see me doing this very quickly. Whole process takes about 45 seconds to do, but it's very invaluable, obviously, in designing our implantation view so that we go in with one implant view and we're very confident that we're going to be deploying the valve in that cusp overlap view. It's not just about the view, though. There's, there's several technical nuances to this technique. We will start with the marker band higher, allowing the valve to eject down in a top-down fashion from the aorta into the left ventricle, thereby really not putting as much apparatus abutting the muscular septum. So that should decrease conduction disturbance rates. We allow the valve to descend down. And then we do control pacing. I would argue for a lot of patients, pacing at a much higher rate is probably advantageous. Here you see us pacing over the left ventricular wire at a rate of 180 beats per minute to get up to the point of no recapture. That really is gonna stabilize the platform. So you let it flower, you pace rapidly up to the point of no recapture, you dial down the pacemaker, and then you proceed. Clearly, if you have someone with a bad ejection fraction, bad coronary artery disease, you don't need to rapidly pace those people, but in the lion's share majority of your patients, it's probably a good idea to do this. 
Finally, we'll do our assessments in the cusp overlap view. We also spin the gantry LIO to make sure we understand where we are relative to the left coronary cusp and understand where the delivery catheter is along the curvature of the aorta that allows us to plan the release of the tabs by either pushing in or maintaining steady pressure uh, on the delivery catheter. And then our final release is very slow and methodical. So the data summary for cusp overlap has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, these are small retrospective studies, but um, you know, they've been great. Uh, obviously, single-digit pacemaker rates across the board. Uh, these are international um, uh, interventionalists uh, who, have, who have been doing this technique now and uh, have achieved proficiency uh, ranging from Canada down to Latin America to Europe, uh, including the United States as well, obviously uh, seeing single-digit pacemaker rates across the board with this technique. Uh, and this has had an effect on the US TVT registry rate of permanent pacemaker implantation post uh, evolute transcatheter heart valve. You can see here that after the US cusp overlap launch, uh, we've seen a very palpable decrease uh, in the rate of permanent pacemaker uh, implantation uh, with the use of the evolute platform. So Optimize Pro is a study that was designed initially to be an evaluation of a conduction disturbance pathway, but since the Evolute low risk data came out showing the advantages of cusp overlap, especially at my center, um, this is now turned in effectively into the cusp overlap trial. And so basically all of the subjects that are being implanted in this study, uh, which are actually gonna be 650 attempted procedures, 400 from the US and Canada, 200 from Europe, and actually another 50 from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it'll be 650 attempted procedures, um, all done using cusp overlap, and we'll be able to see what the clinical outcomes of that are. However, we do have a snapshot of that. That is the interim analysis that was presented by good friend Kendra Grubb at Sky uh, this past year. And so we'll go over some of the data related to that. So the interim analysis basically took 100 patients from the main cohort and 71 roll-in patients and showed what their clinical outcomes were. This shows the baseline characteristics of those patients. Basically, you can see pre-existing right bundle branch block, pre-existing permanent pacemaker, ICD, what those rates are. Obviously, no one came in with a pacemaker in the study that would defeat the purpose. Predominantly a low-risk population, STS predicted risk mortality of less than 3% in almost 64% of the combined cohort. Procedural characteristics, uh, really good use of the double curve Lunderquist wire, which I believe is quite essential at creating a symmetrical and predictable deployment in the majority of your cases. And so the US implanters in this interim analysis became very accustomed to using the double curve Lunderquist and achieving really great outcomes secondary to use of that wire. You can see the amount of pre-dilation and post-dilation that was performed in this study as well. And then of course, shallow implantation depths across the board. Median days to discharge, just one day. Everyone pretty much left within the range of, you know, uh, one day to just, you know, three days max, uh, somewhere around there. But the median uh, day to discharge uh, was, was one, obviously. So 30-day all-cause mortality was zero. Uh, we had 8.8% permanent pacemaker implantation rate in the combined cohort at 30 days. Uh, these are the best outcomes that have been shown in a large study like this related to the Evolute platform. Hemodynamics are, as we've seen with Evolute in the past, really great hemodynamic outcomes, single-digit gradients. And of course, this is something that is eye-popping, but the rate of total aortic regurgitation has definitely come down, not just with use of the Evolute Pro Plus platform or the Pro platform, but with use of cusp overlap because of those uh, leaflets being able to really bind to the external wrap of the Pro, uh, of the Pro we've been able to shut down PVL, and that's shown here. So the interim analysis takeaways are shown here, no deaths, no disabling strokes, low rate of permanent pacemaker implantation, extremely low rates of total aortic regurgitation, great hemodynamics, use of one valve in all 171 patients, no valve embolizations or pop-outs, and of course, we expect this to continue to improve. So we believe that cusp overlap will attain more evidence as an implant heuristic than any other preceding it. We'll have multi-center prospective validation in a real-world population. We really are aiming for best-in-class permanent pacemaker implantation rates with a very short learning curve to achieve, and I really do think this will be the only commercial valve with single-digit pacemaker rates and single-digit gradients that's currently available in the United States. Rates of paravalvular leak and other clinical endpoints will be impacted by the technique. So thanks for your attention, appreciate your time, and looking forward to the rest of this very exciting conference. Hello, I'm Yohei Ono, interventional cardiologist of Tokai University Hospital. I would like to start my presentation of recorded case of Evolute Pro Plus using cusp overlap technique.
this is my conflict of interest. So this patient is Japanese female in her late 80s, presented with progressive dyspnea of NH NYHA class three symptom with very severe AS, bronchiasthma, hypertension, dyslipidemia. She has a small body size, uh, BSA of 1.38, typical Japanese old lady, STS score 9.7%, she's independent, clinical frailty scale of three, and slightly, elevate, slightly elevated BNP 228. This slide shows her electrocardiogram, sinus rhythm with no baseline bundle branch block. Uh, pre tavi um, coronary CT showed no significant lesion in both right and left coronary artery. And cardiac echo showed very severe uh, AS, peak velocity of 5.2 meters, uh, mean pressure gradient of 65, aortic valve area of 0 0.5, um, with preserved ejection fraction of 75%. Uh, this slide shows the uh, CT scan of the uh, this patient, annulus um, perimeter of 69 millimeters, area of 347. Her valsalva is relatively small, 25 to 26 millimeter in width. LVOT size is relatively a little bit smaller than annulus. ST junction is measured as 24 millimeters, and the degree of aortic valve calcification is moderate to severe. Her coronary and sinus valsalva height are shown here. Left coronary height is 10.7 millimeters. Right coronary height is 14 millimeters. Aortic root angle is not significant. Her aorta is somewhat tortuous and some calcification in the aortic arch. Iliofemoral axis seems a feasible, slightly calcified vessel in both sides. Her membranous septum is measured as 5.5 millimeters. So for this patient, uh, we have this kind of setup with transfemoral approach, puncture, conscious sedation, pre-dilatation with uh, Inoue balloon, Japanese domestic balloon, 18 millimeters, since she has very severe aortic stenosis. The valve size, we chose 26 millimeter Evolute Pro Plus. Oversizing rate is around 18%, and we will use RAO caudal view as indicated here for cusp overlap technique. Okay, so welcome to Toka University Hospital. Today we are going to perform transfemoral TAVI with a self-expandable platform, Evolute Pro Plus, uh, using cusp overlap technique. So this novel technique enables us to isolate non-coronary cusp. Therefore, uh, we will be able to um, re reproducibly implant the depth uh, valve in the precise depth. Uh, this patient has quite unique feature that she has quite small sinus of valsalva. Therefore, we are a little bit concerned of coronary obstruction after the valve implantation. So there's always a dilemma in this type of case that we want to implant slightly deeper in order to avoid coronary obstruction. Whereas in order to avoid conduction disturbance, we want to implant a little bit higher. So uh, we are using images, intracardiac echo, to visualize membranous septum, and it will guide us the appropriate depth. Okay, so uh, before beginning the procedure, I would like to introduce our heart team members. Uh, Yohei Ono, interventional cardiologist, and on my right side, he's my buddy, uh, Dr. Norihiko Kamiyo, Kamioka, uh, interventional cardiologist, Dr. Miyamoto, Dr. Saito, Dr. Shigechan. <laughs> <laughs> and our uh, head side, we have an uh, interventional imager, Dr. Horinouchi, and dedicated anesthesiologist, Professor Kenji To. 
just a classical perpendicular view. Looks good. Okay. It looks more or less over. So we proceed. Facing is rate 120. Inflate. Yo. Chini san shiko. Deflate. Facing down. <sighs> the predilatation was effective. Now we are advancing the uh, evolute system using the inline sheet. This is a 14 French equivalent system. And since this patient has small sinus of Balsalva, uh, we need to um, take into account the after post tower corner axis. So we will try to achieve commissure alignment in this patient. So let's see what, how it goes. So the direction of the catheter is important in this setting. As you can see, that we place the flush port at the three o'clock direction, away from the operator. So we will advance the catheter, the arch, pull the wire a little bit. Yep. Nice and smooth. Okay. So the image. So we can beautifully see how the hut marker goes via the outer curvature. So we will uh, start implanting the valve. Let's go. Okay. Okay. Pacing. Pacing. We will start the pacing once the valve is about to. Expand so at this this time the pacing we have good the pacing rate is 100. Let's go slowly. Yep. And we always take a small look at the ice image, which the arrow shows the position of the uh, membrane septum as well as the valve frame. In it. Hemodynamics are very stable. Okay, looks nice, stable. Hmm, I can see this. Soro soro, Okay, let's take a shot here. Toshou zone, save the image. Nice. Looks good. Let's increase the pacing rate to 140. Yeah. Mm. Okay, pacing rate haku. Store the image. So at this point, we, we will check the conduction. If there is a sign of baby block or not. And we have sinus rhythm with narrow QRS. Looks good. So let's see the ice image. The frame, the, the valve frame is within the membrane septum, which is a good sign. Hmm. Not bad. So this is the conventional three cusp view, coplanar view, and we go to LAO in order to check the depth of the LCC side. So you can see the valve frames are very nicely aligned. Um, so we can take a shot here. Just a take a shot. So we can confirm that the valve frame is slightly under the annulus plane. So we would like to advance for the final deployment. So we will use this LAO view in order to release the valve. First, pull the wire in order to release the tension of the system. Okay, nice. Okay, check it out. So 
after the confirmation of the two pedals completely detached from the system, we gently retrieve the system. Okay, the wire position is good. Uh, so the pressure gradient is almost gone, and uh, the diastolic pressure is well separated. Final gradient, mean pressure gradient is six. Okay. So in this view, as we previously mentioned, we can accurately measure the depth of the frame, especially in the NCC side, which is around more or less two or three millimeters. As we aim to do so, so we can see how the ball frames are beautifully aligned in this original four planar view. So this slide shows the post abi electrocardiogram. Uh, left is the baseline, the right is the post abi and sinus rhythm, no additional banner branch block, narrow QRS, so no new onset conduction disturbance. This image shows post abi cardiac echo with a trivial PVL mean pressure gradient of 4.7, uh, effective orifice area of 1.6, uh, which leads to no process patient mismatch. This is an important slide which shows post CT scan. As you can see here, uh, we can recognize the C tab in the two o'clock direction, eight o'clock direction, uh, as shown in this slide. So we basically want to make the coronary axis easy after TAVI uh, evolute valve implantation. And if we insert the delivery cath in the three o'clock direction of the flush port, we can, at most of the time, we can achieve this orientation of the commissure post on this direction. Since the C tab is located in the two o'clock direction, which enables the coronary axis, both left and right coronary axis, relatively easy. So the commissure tab, C tab is located in two o'clock direction. In that kind of cases, the both coronary axis is quite easy and feasible. As Hemo already discussed in the previous talk, uh, the cusp overlap view is achieved by going most of the case RAL coral. This slide shows a comparison of three views frequently used in TAVI, co-planner view, LAO view, which we used to use. And now we're mainly using this cusp overlap view, which isolates non-coronary cusp. And the biggest advantage I assume is that uh, this LVOT elongates in this projection. Therefore we can, um, implant the valve in accurate depth. So the lesson learned from this case, the cusp overlap technique enables us to isolate NCC, therefore implantation of the valve in appropriate depth as aimed within membrane septum would be feasible. Flush port in three o'clock direction while inserting the delivery cath makes easy coronary access in most of the cases. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, Shohei. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, so really happy to have my other colleagues, uh, Dr. Sakamoto and Dr. Tada on. And uh, yeah, I'd like to give them the floor. So why don't we talk a little generally about uh, post-haver coronary access and the importance of commissural alignment. So Dr. Sakamoto, I'll hand it off to you first. And uh, why don't you talk uh, just broadly about your experience using that particular facet of this technique? Yes. So uh, coronary access after uh, TAVI is uh, really important because the uh, TAVI indication uh, goes to more uh, younger ages. So uh, we have to access uh, coronary artery even after uh, TAVI 
uh, in case of uh, ACS or in case of uh, uh, engine epic choice. So we have to uh, care uh, about the uh, 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 alignment uh, to the uh, coronary arteries, I think. Excellent. So, uh, Dr. Tata, in your experience, have you used commissural alignment and how reliable is this flush port technique? Uh, I sometimes use this, but uh, it's a, you know, this is a, a, a good technique, but uh, it is uh, not for everyone, you know, not for the commissural alignment is always uh, uh, good for, nice for the any patient, it decreases the, the risk of the, you know, the commissioner alignment uh, in, the, in front of the coronary ostium. So I, it, I think this is good technique, but it's not for the, everyone, every any patient. I see. And so, you know, I mean, one of the issues that I've had with this particular technique is that sometimes the commissures don't align in a predictable way. And uh, you don't you don't necessarily have that feedback with the current generation platform. Now, the next generation platform, which is the Evolute FX platform, will actually have markers demarcating the commissures that are going to be placed three millimeters up from the base of the valve. And so we'll be able to really have a real time assessment on where the neo commissures uh, will be placed relative to the native anatomy prior to full tab release and actually seeing where that C-tab is. Um, and then obviously, you know, not necessarily needing uh, to, to necessarily just go by the marker band orientation as it would relate to the aorta. So I think that'll be a very welcome innovation. So Yohei, I, I just wanted to talk to you about your experience with commissural alignment. So um, what are some patients where maybe you've not noticed it line up? Are there any anatomical features there that you can kind of describe? Yeah, thank, thanks. Uh, um, I think, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, presentation, I, th I believe that in most of the patients, I would say maybe around 80% of the cases, uh, if you uh, deliver the cath in this direction, uh, we can achieve it. But uh, I always try to check the position of the hot marker when we go up the uh, descending aorta as the hot marker needs to be in the outside of the uh, aorta. So I tend to uh, rotate if, if the position is not appropriate, if possible, and um, uh, always confirm this uh, uh, commissure alignment uh, with post diversity. But in some patients with, with which coronary arteries are um, the ostium, the pos position of the ostium, ostium is located in some weird direction, let's say uh, 10 or 11 o'clock in the right coronary or towards the six o'clock in the left coronary artery, it will be some, sometimes difficult to achieve this uh, coronary uh, commissure alignment. That's excellent points. And I think that we find that a little bit more present with bicuspid aortic valves, which I know are, are generally more prevalent in the Japanese population than they would be in the United States. So Yoi, can you talk a little bit about um, bicuspid uh, valves and do you, do you use this technique with, with mm -hmm. cusp overlap, do you modify it? And then um, do you do commissural alignment with your bicuspid aortic valve patients? And are there any tips and tricks that you have for that? Thanks so much for your great question. Actually, um, Dr. Shimamura has raised this nice question in the chat box, so I think it's worthwhile discussing here. Um, I believe for type 1 bicuspid, uh, we can uh, apply this uh, cusp overlet te technique. However, in type 0, uh, true bicuspid uh, aortic uh, valve disease, I think it's difficult. So whenever it's cause type 1 by cuspid, I try to apply this technique. But in case of very horizontal aortic uh, uh, aorta, uh, this technique would be difficult. So in that kind of case, I tend to use uh, LAO technique. So uh, how about the experience uh, with you, Hemo, and uh, yeah. Dr. Tada, Dr. Sakamoto? 
So I'll take it on. I mean, basically, we we have adopted or or maybe modified this technique a little bit for our CIRA zero bicuspid uh, patients, and I think it works quite well. So really, it is about deploying relative to the membranous septum fluoroscopically, right? And so you want to view on the screen that basically elongates that membranous septum and left ventricular outflow tract in the center of the screen. So when we're reconstructing the annular plane on our reconstruction software, what we'll do is we'll artificially separate that leaflet that really is right above the membranous septum. And so instead of just putting one dot marker for marking the insertion of that leaflet, we'll put two dot markers basically flanking where that membranous septum is. And by doing that, we set up a view that basically accentuates the membranous septum in the center of the screen. And having that pigtail placed posteriorly, we're able to, again, guide valve deployment relative to the conduction anatomy. And I think that this provides a lot of precision with deployment. It's a very minimal modification that you have to make to your bicuspid patients. And typically you get right in the ballpark of what is going to create a parallax free view with regards to the delivery catheter marker band, which I think is very important in providing a lot of assurance that you are actually deploying the valve where you want to deploy it. Uh, you know, if you do go to an LAO type of projection, keep in mind, again, that the left ventricular outflow tract will likely not be elongated, as, as was pointed out by Yohei in his presentation. And uh, that actually may lead to a lot of uncertainty with where you are actually landing the valve. Um, so using uh, commensurate imaging like intracardiac echo that uh, Yohei was doing during his case, or transesophageal echo concomitantly during the procedure, uh, that may provide you with another level of certainty that you may need in cases that have kind of uh, aberrant anatomy like that. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Dr. Sakamoto. I, what has been your experience with bicuspid patients and have you applied this technique in any way? Yes, uh, I think uh, Cusp overlap technique is also available, uh, in particular, uh, type 1 uh, by cuspid. Uh, in particular, uh, with uh, LAFE between uh, RCC and LCC. So uh, that is a really good uh, indication for cusp overlap technique in a uh, bicuspid. But the other type of type 1 uh, bicuspid or type 0, I don't think uh, this technique is uh, good. So uh, I have a question uh, for uh, Dr. Ono. So ice um, uh, monitoring is also uh, good. Uh, for the bias bit tabby uh, with uh, Evolute system? Thank you so much for a uh, great, great question. Um, as for bicuspid patients, we can visualize the membrane septum uh, during the procedure with trans uh, uh, intracardic echo. So uh, I believe it, um, in terms of avoiding nuanced conduction disturbance, it will make a, a role uh, even with bicuspid patients. Um, but in terms of um, appropriate depth uh, implantation with bicuspid, you know, there's a debate whether we should uh, implant the valve slightly higher in order to seal the valve in the uh, superannular uh, position uh, of the uh, sinus of valve salva or try to seal as it is in the tricuspid aortic valve disease. It, it depends on the anatomy, I guess. Okay, thank you. Dr. Tata, do you have any comments with regards to your bicuspid patients? Yeah, uh, I think that the uh, intercardic echo, like on Dr. Ono, is it's very good uh, method. I'd like to uh, try this. Uh, but uh, my concern is the not always uh, higher implantation is not, not for good for the coronary access, you know, or uh, Evoluto is a superannular uh, uh, position. So higher implantation is going to be uh, difficult for the coronary access. We, we, we should take, we should consider the balance of the uh, conduction disturbance and the coronary access or coronary obstruction. Excellent. I guess that's, that's extremely important. I guess that's an extremely important comments from Dr. Tada. So in this specific case that we demonstrated, the patient had 
memory septum length of relatively long, 5.5 millimeters. So we aim to implant the valve slightly deeper since the patient had small sinus of valsalva and we had a concern of uh, coronary obstruction and future coronary axis. Thank you for your nice comment. Yeah. yeah. So you know, yeah, you are me. eyes technically the, we can you we can uh, deploy very exact the place and <laughs> we can monitor the depths using this uh, ice ice. That's why I like this. Very exactly, good. that's the advantage of this technique. Thank you. Yohei, can you talk a little bit more about your particular outcomes using the cusp overlap technique in the time remaining? Yes, so um, as you may know, we have uh, Ocean Tavi uh, Registry uh, throughout Japan, and we only have preliminary data, but we collected almost 200 patients uh, with six uh, high volume centers in Japan, and our initial outcome of new pacemaker implantation rate was actually 4.8%. So I guess we have achieved relatively good numbers. Um, so please wait for our final manuscript and uh, we, all, we also look forward to it. That's really just excellent. So can you uh, tell us, you know, what it, the, the six vo high volume centers that were involved, how is cusp overlap kind of disseminated to those centers and is everyone kind of doing it the same way? Is there any variability in how the technique is being applied? Well, that's also important technique to make this technique universal and easier for the also new implanters. So uh, I guess in these six centers, since there is um, Evolute Proctor in each institution, uh, we have more or less similar, or I would say almost the same, um, technique in terms of cusp overlap technique. Of course, there are some differences that we use. Some some tend to use um, Lunderquist, as you suggested. Some use um, um, the other type of uh, pre-shaped uh, uh, stiff wire, so on. There are some small tips and tricks, but overall, we apply almost the same technique. That's excellent. Yohei, is there any learning curve that you've experienced with this technique? And then I'll toss it over to the other discussants as well. Um, how many cases did it take you to become relatively proficient uh, with the technique? Well, as you emphasized in your slide uh, presentation, I guess the key is to take a very accurate, high quality CT image uh, prior to the uh, procedure. So if, you, if we have high quality CT image, we already know how the uh, RAO caught of you can uh, use to uh, improve this technique. So the combination of the high quality CT as well as the step-by-step uh, -step, uh, method, as you mentioned, DART technique. Um, I guess I would say five to 10 cases with nice um, guidance uh, would be uh, feasible for this early learning curve. Dr. Tata, you've embraced this technique as well. I mean, how many cases did it kind of take for you to become proficient at it? Yeah, I th I also think the five to ten, but uh, uh, in during the manual labor, the, uh, the the device push and pull, you know, uh, cusp overlapping technique is just a technique going deeper and shallower. But in the area of view, it's going to tilt, and uh, you know, we can see the how device is tilt and stand up. So we can uh, see how how area view the uh, looks like the cast, and how the area of view looks like cast. We we need to uh, understand the both angle, and after that we can do the. Good, con good control of that device. Excellent. Dr. Sakamoto, any final comments? Yes. Uh, when, when I went to the, the beginner uh, institute uh, for uh, uh, proctoring, so uh, I taught them uh, this technique uh, in, the, uh, in the second cases. Uh, so, uh, but the, uh, they are doing well. So uh, I think uh, this technique is uh, very uh, universal and the, uh, convenient for even a beginner uh, institute. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.
Well, you know, the time has flown by. Uh, we appreciate uh, Medtronic for sponsoring this session. And of course, this is a very exciting conference. Uh, looking forward to future sessions. So on behalf of Dr. Ono, Dr. Sakamoto, Dr. Tada, thank you so much for attending uh, this meeting. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in future sessions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.